So, without any other hints, I bet you can guess what this video is going to be about. Recently, <laughs> uh, I was watching one of my favorite YouTube channels called 60 Symbols. And uh, it's an interesting channel that's run out of the University of Nottingham in the UK. And Brady Hannon is the producer and the videographer. And it's sort of a compilation of series of videos that are done as interviews of professors in different departments of the university. Astronomy and physics and uh, engineering, computer science and chemistry. And uh, the video that I'm referring to here is one that was done by Professor Polakoff uh, that went over some of the properties of helium. And he started out just like I did with the goofy Donald Duck sort of speaking. But then he asked an interesting question, and that was, if you took a cell phone and you put it in helium, would it change the, uh, the timbre of the sound? And so they lowered a bag of helium over the uh, cell phone, and lo and behold, there was no change in the, the frequency. It sounded the same, except it was remarkably quieter. And I found that pretty interesting, and as a matter of fact, more interesting than the, uh, the frequency response with the helium. And so I did a little bit of research, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through uh, some of those properties, but I'm going to get into an explanation of why they occur. And I'm also going to talk about why they may be important and even useful. To begin with, the reason that your voice sounds different when you breathe helium is not because of the vocal cords. The vocal cords induce or start the vibration process that will eventually produce your voice. And the frequency that they vibrate at depends on the mass of the vocal cord and the tension that it's under. It doesn't really matter if it's vibrating in helium or air, it's going to produce roughly the same frequency. If you take a guitar string, you take it off the guitar, you clamp it in a vise, pull it with the pliers and pluck it, you'll hear a vibration. But if you put that guitar string back on the guitar, you hear a much different sound and that's because of all the overtones and the harmonics that are created as the vibration stimulates stimulate those uh, vibrations in the guitar body. It's actually the guitar wood that's interacting with those vibrations that produces the sound. In your voice box, which is an open cavity inside of your throat, the vibrating stimulus from your vocal cords induces pressure waves or sound waves to bounce back and forth within the chamber. And it's those vibrations within that resonant cavity that create all the overtones and the harmonics that eventually produce what you hear as your voice. Because the energy, of the thermal energy of helium atoms is roughly the same as the thermal energy of an air molecule, but because helium is about seven times lighter than nitrogen or oxygen, which constitute air, the only way that's possible is if the velocity, remember one half mv squared, if the velocity is about two and a half to three times higher. So in air, the speed of sound is about 350 meters per second, and in helium, it's about 1,000 meters per second. The sound waves travel about three times more quickly through the helium. So when those vibrations are bouncing back and forth within the space inside the voice box, they're hitting the walls and reflecting about three times as quickly. And so what ends up happening is you will amplify overtones and harmonics that are about three times as high. Even though all those frequencies are still present, it's those higher frequencies that dominate. You'd get the same sort of effect if you took a voice box in air and reduced its dimensions by about three times. So the frequency that we're going to be hearing is primarily affected by the speed of sound, and the speed of sound is affected by the mass. Now the same principle as with your voice box will apply to woodwind instruments or anything with a resonant cavity. If I play the flute, now if I play the flute in air, you hear this same sound. Listen as I go into a helium environment. 
hear the sound, it's much different. Now, as a little warning here, uh, don't try this at home. Uh, you don't want to immerse yourself in a helium atmosphere and breathe it because even though helium is not toxic, it won't support life. And what we're using here is a mixture of helium and a little bit of oxygen. It's called a heliox mix. And I know how to do that, but if you don't have experience with that, stay away from it because a couple of breaths of this, you get dizzy. A few more breaths of this, you probably collapse. So that's my warning. Now, the flute operates a little bit like your voice box in that it's a resonator. They call it a Helmholtz resonator. And you can look that up on, on uh, Google it or Wikipedia. It, but fundamentally what's occurring when the flute plays is that as you blow across the mouthpiece, you create a high velocity jet. And by the Bernoulli principle, because the jet entrains or pulls air into it, it pulls air from the surrounding environment as well as out of the mouthpiece and into the jet, lowering the air pressure inside the tube below the mouthpiece. That low air pressure begins to induce air molecules to begin moving up the tube, and that induction or that low pressure wave moves down the tube at the speed of sound. As that pressure continues to drop here, it eventually reaches a point where the high velocity jet can no longer remain stable. It begins to stall and you get turbulent eddies and the air actually begins to move into the tube below the mouthpiece. You develop a high pressure wave which then begins to fill the tube and eventually when the pressure becomes near atmospheric enough the, the uh, velocity jet uh, reestablishes its uh, laminar flow and the whole process begins again and that happens several hundred times per second. In helium, because of the high speed of sound through helium and the low viscosity as well, the, all of those processes I just described occur three times more quickly. So the tone of the flute goes up when you play it in helium. Interestingly, the wavelengths of the sound are the same, but the frequency is higher because the wavelengths of all sounds are higher or are longer and stretched out because the speed of sound in helium is, uh, is much higher. Now, if I did the same sort of experiment, except not my voice, not a woodwind, but I use a speaker, you hear this tone. If I go inside of the helium bag with this speaker playing at the, at the microphone on my chest, you'll hear that the tone doesn't change in the speaker, but it does change in my voice. But you'll also notice another property, is that the sound or the amplitude became significantly less when I went into the helium. The reason that occurs is because the speaker is not a resonant cavity. It's not depending on the vibrations back and forth within some sort of a chamber and depending on the speed of, of uh, sound in helium. The sound gets from the speaker to my microphone three times faster, but it's a straight shot. And so it doesn't have anything to do with changing the timbre of the sound. The interesting thing though that I discovered when I watch, was watching the video, and it's something I'd never seen before, was that attenuation of the sound, that reduction in the intensity. And when I saw that, I had one of those you know, light bulb moments and thought, yeah, I'd never seen that before, but I bet I know how I could use that. So let me demonstrate that attenuation with this other apparatus I have here that makes it much clearer how significant that attenuation is. Now, inside of this bag, it's just filled with air, but I have an identical speaker to the one that I was just using. And when I play the sound, uh, from the amplifier. You'll see on my phone up here is a decibel meter and it'll be reading the amount of sound that gets to the decibel meter as it leaves the speaker, travels through the air in the bag, through the wall of the bag and over to the phone over there. Now when I don't say anything, take a look at the decibel reading. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach the tubing on this bag, this fill bag, to a vacuum and I'm going to pull out as much of the air as I possibly can. This is going to get a little bit loud. 
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill up the bag with some helium as opposed to air. Now you remember it was running about 60 decibels. I haven't adjusted or done anything to the amplifier so the speaker is still putting out the same amount of sound. And it's pretty much the same even when it's attached to the plastic, maybe a little louder. Now at first the helium makes a lot of noise with its jet, but listen and watch the decibel meter. The reason it continues to get quieter is actually because we're diluting the remaining air. As I'll explain later, that's the only reason. As you can see, the decibels have gone down at least 20, maybe as much as 30 fold. Now you should understand that decibels are a logarithmic scale. Every 10 decibels is another 10 fold reduction in noise pressure and noise energy. So 10 decibels less is 10 times less. 20 decibels less is 10 times 10 or 100 times less. 30, 1000 times less. So the sound attenuation we see with this layer of helium is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 fold. And the reason this is occurring is because of two major principles that I'm going to explain to you, and it has to do with the mass of the helium. The most interesting part of this, though, is actually what you'll see when I start to withdraw the helium as I take the helium out of the bag. Let's start with where the sound is and what happens when I, as I reduce it. Call it 3031. Here goes the vacuum. Now I'm going to begin removing the helium, but I'm going to do it in stages. So we're going to see what happens as we reduce the thickness of the layer of helium between the bag and the speaker. And we'll see what the effect is on the sound reduction. Let's take some more out. Still over a hundred fold reduction. See if we can make it a little bit thinner. As you can see, we still have about a 25 decibel reduction in sound. And the reason this is significant is because the sound reduction that occurs with the helium is due to two effects that have really very little to do with the distance that the sound travels through helium. The first principle is momentum transfer. When the speaker is inducing energy in the gas that it's moving, it doesn't matter what the, the gas is, whether it's air or whether it's helium the velocity profile, the amplitude of the piston effect of the speaker is the same. 
But when it's moving helium atoms, it's actually moving objects that weigh seven or eight times less than air. So just like me throwing a ping pong ball at you or a ball bearing at you, even if I throw them at the same speed, you'd rather be hit by the ping pong ball. So about one seventh the sound energy actually is radiated away from the speaker because it's, it's moving lighter particles. The second reason is a property called impedance matching. Over here, I have a little demonstration. I'm sure you've seen this before uh, in physics class or in science class. The most efficient way to transfer energy from one object to, the, to another in an elastic collision is when the objects have the same mass. Except for friction, most of the energy of this first ball is transferred to the second ball. And it doesn't matter how heavy the balls are, whether they're as heavy as air molecules or whether they're as heavy as air molecules or helium atoms. It is the relative mass that determines the efficiency of the transfer. Now if I have heavy air molecules hitting a very light helium molecule, the, the helium is going to pick up a lot of energy, but most of the, air, uh, the, mo the energy from the air molecule is going to remain in the air molecule. But what's important is if you reverse the process and you take a heavy air molecule and strike it with a light helium molecule, very little of the energy is transferred to the heavier particle. Most of it is reflected back. So the helium atoms, when they strike the bag, which is backed up by air, effectively they don't um, transmit or transfer very much of their energy, essentially one-seventh of the energy that an air molecule would when it hits the bag, just as you saw when we filled the bag with air. The reason this is significant is because both of these properties are surface effects. And as long as your noisemaker isn't jumping around like a, bouncing around like a jumping bean, these effects are microns thick. And so effectively, you can reduce sound by, we've seen, over a hundredfold, 20 decibels, with even very thin layers of helium. Because the energy isn't lost through the helium, it's lost in the interfaces. And the reason that's so significant is because trying to attenuate sound with layers of material that are far less than a millimeter thick and doing so at the level of maybe 20 decibels is extraordinary. There's no material in existence that can do that except for hydrogen, which is even lighter and cheaper, but it tends to explode, or the ultimate, a vacuum but which requires very strong, robust walls to maintain the, the space in an atmosphere. And so one of the applications that this might be interesting for is thermal windows. I'm sure you're aware of how a thermal window works. It's basically two layers of glass with, say, an inert atmosphere like argon placed between them to decrease thermal transmission through the window. There are triple pane windows that are made, often to just increase that thermal resistance by putting glass, argon, glass, argon, glass. Interestingly, what would happen if you replaced one of those inert atmospheres with something that has very poor energy transfer and impedance matching, like helium? You might get thermal insulation and noise insulation, which is kind of an interesting thought if you're doing some remodeling and you want to try to attenuate noise. If you don't want to have a manufacturer make you a special window, you might be able to get, say, two dual pane windows with argon, separate them, and fill the cavity with some helium. The metal seals and the glass are very uh, resistant to helium leakage and would probably keep that helium in for years. Another application that you might try is taking sheets of polyester film like these. You take two sheets, you put them together, and you place a bead of glue all the way around the outside. So if you built a stack of these things, you might be able to fill alternating layers with, say, helium air, helium air. You might even go helium sulfur hexafluoride, which is even denser than air and would be even more effective. But very thin layers of poor impedance and poor transmission, you could do it yourself. It's inexpensive. It's lightweight. It, heck, it may even be buoyant. And if you use metal coated polyester like a space blanket, it tends to be very resistant to the leakage of helium, which is pesky to retain because of the fact that it has very, very tiny little atoms. But nevertheless, that might be another way that you may be able to build a barrier using this kind of a technique. So in the next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some of these principles in some actual engineering examples, like how you might be able to do this, and then we'll 
will analyze the, the performance of those structures based on using helium. So if you find this interesting, and I do, uh, please subscribe to the channel. And for those of you that have subscribed, I really want to thank you because uh, we're getting much broader recognition and the channel is expanding at an accelerating rate. And that's because of you. So really, thanks a lot and I'll see you soon.